morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Palm Sunday. It is a joy to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is the beginning of Holy Week. It is the first day of the Holy Week remembrance of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Today is called pa Palm Sunday. It's also called Passion Sunday. We begin the day with remembrances of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We will raise our palm branches high as we sing our first hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. And then by the end of this service, we will remember the end of the week, that holy week, when Jesus was crucified. It's quite a uh, dramatic week for all of us. And we also invite you to join us for Maundy Thursday at 7 p.m. when we'll celebrate the Last Supper and the foot washing that Jesus did for his disciples. And Good Friday at, on Friday at 7 p.m. where we re rehearse those scriptures of the Passion story and extinguish one candle for each reading and hear beautiful sacred music for Passion, for Good Friday service. So both of those services are at 7 p.m. And of course, our Easter celebration is on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We hope you will join us for that beautiful feast and celebration on that day. I'd like to also point out that there is an insert in your bulletin. If you'd like to donate a, a lily for Easter Sunday, you can use this bulletin insert. And at any time in the service, just include this in, with your offering in the offering plate or hand it at any time to the office so that this lily can be given in honor of a loved one or a friend. Um, and we also this morning have a prayer shawl to be given uh, in honor of Peggy Ross. It's requested by Rion Boydston Howard, will you join me in this prayer to bless the prayer shawl? Dear Lord, bless this shawl, the work of loving hands. We give thanks for the hands that have made it, and we pray for Peggy, who will receive it. May your spirit embrace Peggy through the gift of this shawl. Weave us together in a fabric of Christian love, so we may serve your kingdom as one. Amen. Now will you stand as you're able for the call to worship. Our king has come riding on a donkey. Hosanna in the highest. Our savior has arrived among waving palms and cheers of praise. Shout, Shout alleluia, alleluia to the king. Jesus has come to show us the greatness of God's love. Blessed, Blessed is the Lord one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. The first scripture of this morning is Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, People kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second scripture for this morning is Luke 23, verses 1 through 5, 32 through 37, and 44 through 46. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is a Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, Stir up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began, to this place. Two others also were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They also cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. Then the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. It was, not, it was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while well, the sunlight failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Let us pray together before I offer a message this morning. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning we come to Palm Sunday, the final Sunday in a series of sermons we've been calling Receiving Grace. And we'll find that during this Sunday scripture and also in the week to come, this Holy Week, we receive a key to receiving God's grace fully. Many of us may have difficulty receiving. Many of us would rather give. It's easier to give a gift than to receive for so many of us. And this is also true of God's grace. And this Lenten season is all about growing in faith, receiving God's grace. Most of the year we're talking about serving others and feeding the hungry, serving the poor, serving our neighbors. But during Lent, it's a perfect time to quiet our lives, to receive God's gifts, to make sure that we are built up enough in faith so that we have something to give to this world. We're invited this morning to completely receive grace this week, to open our hearts, to let God love us, to let God forgive us, to let God bestow upon us God's grace. We've sometimes heard this phrase, you can't love others until you love yourself. That's kind of true, but I have a problem with it. You can, of course, do something for others, serve others, love others, no matter how you feel about yourself. In fact, sometimes when you serve others, you, you might jumpstart the love in your heart and uh, realize what it is to give and receive love once again. But I do think it's true that the amount of love that we can receive may determine how much we can give. In other words, if we are not open to completely receiving love, we may not be able to completely give love. The depth at which we are able to receive God's grace may very well be the depth and capacity that we have to share 
God's grace with others. To live completely, to love completely, means we must receive completely, and therein lies the hitch. We usually have trouble receiving completely for one reason or another. I learned this in seminary. It was an answer to prayer because for years in college and my teenage years, but especially in my college years, I would ask God, what does this mean that Jesus died for our sins on this cross, that Jesus is our Savior? What does it mean to be saved by grace? What does any of that mean? I want to be a Christian, God. I want to follow you, but I don't have an idea what it means to say that Jesus sa saves me or dies for the forgiveness of my sins. Those aren't phrases we hear a whole lot in Methodist Sunday schools. You hear them more at the Southern Baptist Church. <laughs> Some of you may uh, attest to that, or the Pentecostal churches that in our, are in our community. But, but let's think about what that phrase means to us. And I struggled with that in college. I said, God, I will go ahead and follow Jesus. I, I like that part of our faith, but I don't know what this means, that he dies for the forgiveness of my sins or that the cross somehow saves me. I was scratching my head, I, and I said, God, I will continue to follow you, but please explain that to me sooner than later, because I really want to know. And if I want to become a pastor, I need to know <laughs> what that means. And so thank God, my second year of seminary, I received a wonderful lesson in a class on theology, the theology of who Jesus is, and the meaning of his atonement for our sins, and the incarnation of God in Christ. And this wonderful professor, Dwight Vogel, lent us a book called God Was in Christ, and I bought a copy for myself. And this book opened my eyes to what the cross truly can mean to the human heart. D.M. Bailey writes in this book, it is the very beauty of the penitence which is according to God that at the last the sinner realizing God's forgiveness, does learn to forgive himself. My eyes were opened. I realized that this act of receiving God's grace is the same as forgiving one's self. Being forgiven by Jesus' gift on the cross, his sacrifice, means that we fully and completely accept God's forgiveness and we forgive our own selves. This is a lifelong journey. Many of us have those objections in our minds. And those objections and those hitches explain this Holy Week. The Holy Week itself was a complicated time because people welcomed Jesus with palm branches. They were filled with love and gratitude for all the healings that he had performed. Think of the love that they outpoured toward Jesus as they laid these palm branches on the streets, their way of making straight the path of a king laying out the red carpet, if you will, for his, his donkey. But by the end of that week, one week, some of them were calling for his crucifixion and execution. What happened? It turned out that their love was conditional. Their love had an expectation that Jesus would also ride in and bring them to victory over the Roman emperor. It was a foolhardy idea, but they believed that God could do it in Jesus and that this would mean political victory for the people of Israel. And as soon as they realized that Jesus was not going to complete the deal and lead them to military victory, they betrayed him. They gave up on him. They began to look elsewhere for their Messiah. They gave him up to the hands of the Romans who were relatively willing to kill people like Jesus who might be, willing, who might be a threat to Roman power perhaps an insurgent. And therefore, he was, by the end of that week, crucified unjustly. But yet, at the end of that week, Jesus still loves. Though the people's love for him was conditional upon his performance of certain duties as a Messiah, his love for them was unconditional. Never did he retaliate. Never did he speak condemnation. Even in the face of the ugliest human sin, the murderous words of the crowds. Never did he judge or condemn harshly any of those persons. Instead, 
from the cross, he prayed a prayer for all to hear, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Still he spoke forgiveness. In those seminary studies and with the help of this teaching of D.M. Bailey, my eyes were open to the fact that many persons throughout the earth will have objections, including myself, including all of us. We will have objections to receiving the pure, unconditional love of God. Perhaps until we hear those words spoken from the cross. Now, it's not so hard for many of us to acknowledge God loves us and God forgives us. Perhaps the cross was mystifying to me because I was well loved by my parents growing up. I knew I would be loved by them no matter what and forgiven, perhaps, <laughs> no matter what. Uh, I believe so. I'll have to check with them. <laughs> but I experienced that grace and love at home. It wasn't a big leap for me to believe that God loved and forgave me as my parents had already demonstrated. But think of the multitudes around this earth who have been told that they're worthless for one reason or another, who have been told that because of their background or their sexual orientation or their upbringing in whatever way, they are worthless. They're condemnable. Consider the messages that people receive throughout the this lifetime, which can be so hard. Or think of those friends and loved ones that we have that have come to that conclusion on their own. That they are not worthy of God's love. That they are not good persons. Somehow people do begin to believe such lies. The cross is here to tell us otherwise. If people would say, yes, I know God loves me, but I'm not a good person. Yes, I know God loves me, but I've made terrible mistakes. God speaks to us through the cross. Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Still, love prevails. Still, we're invited to completely receive the grace of God. And we can say to someone like that, a friend, God saw the most ugly, raw sin of humankind, the most murderous acts of people who put to death the innocent Son of God, and still God, through Jesus, spoke love and forgiveness. Amen? We can say that to people, and perhaps that will compel the human heart that I, too, can be forgiven. I, too, can be loved. I, too, can be saved by grace. All I have to do is to receive that gift, to say yes to the grace God offers. What a treasure now and eternally to be given this forgiveness and blessing. We might think of our own yes buts that we have in our minds. Um, we may think at first that we don't have many, but they're there. Um, I might say to God, I know that you love me, but I was a very impatient father sometimes, and I said some things to my kids that I wish I never had said, and to my wife as well, and to my coworkers here at the church, <laughs> and to church members. There are those mistakes that I wish I could take back. Yes, but. Or I might say to myself, I know that you love me, God, but I continue to put fossil fuel fumes into the air and contribute to the damage of this climate because driving to San Diego, riding my bicycle to San Diego for a board meeting is a long, long trip, Lord. I need to drive my Honda, please. <laughs> These residual feelings of guilt and shame are our objection to God's love and grace. And the message of the gospel is that we first receive this gift of grace and then God works on all these little sins that we commit later. God helps us to go on to perfect, perfection through what we call in the Wesleyan tradition, sanctifying grace. But first we receive completely the grace of God. I invite us to take a moment of silent prayer to think about 
these objections that we might have in our hearts. Yes, I know you love me, God, but I invite you to confess and to share that prayer with God. Now look to this cross where Jesus still speaks, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And then he breathes his last. And then he is raised again because our sin is not nearly enough to defeat the love and grace of God. Amen. And then the Spirit of Christ lives among us and breathes life into us. And the Holy Spirit fills this church with life and love and has deepened our capacity to serve those around us, fully receiving so that we may fully give ourselves to every neighbor who is in need. This truth of Holy Week reminds me of a lesson I learned from a comedy troupe. There was an improvisational comedy troupe that came to a summer camp where I served at Camp Lazy W one summer. And the comedy troupe was uh, teaching the staff how we can best be a staff for the kids who come to summer camp that, that summer. And they taught us a wonderful lesson. They said, while you're doing improvisational comedy, it's important to know the rule, yes and. Not yes, but, and never no, but, but yes, and. In other words, if your partner on the stage says some crazy harebrained thing to try to be funny, you, don't, you never say no, uh, but, or yes, but, because as soon as you give some answer like that, you shut them down, you tell the whole audience that that person messed up and we've, we're on the wrong track. But if you learn to say yes, and, and you build on their creativity, you share your own crazy idea and put it right on top of theirs, everything stays joyful. The person is affirmed for their idea, however lousy it was, and everyone keeps laughing and having a great time. Jesus' words on the cross are a yes and. Yes, I know you have sinned. Yes, I know you have polluted this world. Yes, I know you have hurt one another. Yes, I know you have hurt and tried and are killing me. And you are forgiven. And you are loved. And you are saved forevermore. Jesus shows us the way to say yes and to ourselves, to others. What if we could answer every sin that we have committed, every tendency to condemn ourselves with yes and, yes, James, I know you have messed up. Yes, I know you have hurt other people. And God loves you infinitely, eternally, forevermore. What if we learn to speak to ourselves in this way? What if we learn to forgive ourselves in this way, as God has forgiven us. Let us take our sin to the foot of the cross, take our burden to the cross, and leave it there, as the old hymn says, so that we may again lift our palm branches high, praising the one who loves us and forgives us, receiving God's grace completely, so that we may completely love and forgive ourselves our neighbors, and praise the God who has loved us so. May it be so. Amen. Let us sing together, Sacred Head, Now Wounded.
in the spirit of prayer. God of grace, we give thanks that you have come and lived among us, not to judge and condemn, but to free us by your love. We rejoice that your grace never falters, not even when you were unjustly tried and beaten and crucified. Help us then not to falter in our rece receiving of your gift of grace. Whatever our objections or conditions that we would impose upon your love for us, take them all away so that we may freely receive the love and grace you give. As we deepen our capacity to be loved, help us in turn to deepen our love for others, for loved ones, for strangers, for all of your creation. Forgive our sin, God of mercy. May we leave it forever at the foot of your cross until we forgive ourselves as you forgive us. Reign in our hearts and in your world, Prince of Peace, so that all people may know that they are worthy in your eyes. Send your spirit throughout the earth to protect this world from harm. Teach us to love and care for your creation, to preserve it for future generations. Help us to preserve your peace upon the earth. We ask that you would stay the hand of those who love war and those who abuse power to harm the innocent. Let your peace prevail throughout the earth. We pray, O oh God, that you would continue to heal this earth of illness, that you would cure it of all pandemic illness, that COVID-19 would disappear from the face of the earth, and that you would cure all those who are sick. Comfort especially those who mourn the loss of their loved ones. Guide your church, O oh God, to be a beacon of hope, to be people who have fully received your grace so that your love may prevail through the works of our hands, so that nothing may make us stop serving you or trusting in your risen spirit. Holy Spirit, we offer all these prayers in your name, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit. As we lift to you in a time of silent prayer, our praises, petitions, and confessions. And now, let us join with the Holy Spirit in offering our prayers of love and hope as a faith family. We lift before you, God, our home-centered members. They are much loved, although they cannot be with us in person. Their spirits are turned to us and we turn ours to them. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We lift up the members of the military, those who are connected with our church family and those who are not known to us, but who serve and try their very best to help promote peace and freedom. We pray they come home to their loved ones in safety. Lord, 
In your grace, hear our prayer. We ask you, God, to give your blessing to the ministries of our church. Especially as we enter Holy Week, may the observances that have been planned indeed communicate to all who participate the love and great gift and great grace that you have shown us through the life and suffering and finally resurrection of Jesus. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We lift, Lord, before you people who are facing instability in food and housing. There are people in our own community who are lacking the basics that they need. And there are people throughout the world, whether the cause is, is war and destruction or other things, Lord, we pray that we will be able in any way we can to help them meet their needs. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. We lift before you from deep in our hearts the people in this world who are dealing with violence. Again, some are close to home, maybe even some of us, but also people around the world. We think especially of those in the Ukraine, but that's not the only part of the world where there is violence and suffering. And we pray, Lord, that peace may reign. We pray now for some members of our congregation. We pray with them, with Bill and Peggy Ranny. Bill's brother fell at home, and he's in the hospital. We pray, Lord, that he will be healed quickly and be able to return to life as normal very soon. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And we pray with Sherry Hanberg for her neighbor, Carmen. Carmen is experiencing some heart problems and will be going to the ER today if she has not already done so. Lord, we pray for peace and healing for Carmen and her loved ones. And Lord, in your grace, yeah. hear our prayer. Now together, may we lift up the words that Jesus taught us that we may be one in heart and mind and spirit with each other and with God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue in our worship.
Jesus came as our King to share your blessings with the world. The one who was greatest among us became the least of us.
us go from this place walking with Jesus through this holy week, walking with each other in the grace of God. And may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us forever. Amen.